no impact as such. It was just like jamming your brakes on a car. And uh, that was that. She stopped. We had a porthole open. I looked out. The sky was clear. The stars were shining. The sea was dead calm. And I thought, I don't know. I couldn't understand it. So I came out of my cabin and I thought, well, I'd go forward. And I went forward to the well deck on the starboard side and I could see ice in the well deck. There's no sign of iceberg then because it passed us. And the lights were shining on the water from the portholes. There's no sign of damage above water line. And of course, what had happened, we slipped over the iceberg. And although she was supposed to be unsinkable, with a double bottom, the iceberg had cut her from forward on the starboard side to the engine room, almost amidships, right through her two bottoms. And we had orders to get the lifeboats out. And of course, the order, the same old order, women and children. And we swung the lifeboats out and gradually filled them up. First boats were away on the port side. The first boats away didn't have many passengers on board. They were afraid to go down. There was a 70-foot drop to the water. And they didn't think she was going to sink. And a few of the first boats on the port side got away with half filled. Don't forget, we had 16 lifeboats. And uh, they each carried 50. And if they'd been filled, we could have saved 800, whereas we only saved 500. So you can imagine there were many seats in the first lifeboats, vacant. Um, then I had orders to uh, go down the storeroom with a gang of men and get all the biscuits we could find. When we got back up onto the boat deck, we couldn't get near the lifeboats. Some people were scrambling to get in, being pushed back. By that time, she was listing very badly to port. We couldn't get the starboard boats down. But before I got my life belt on, I met a young couple, and uh, I'll tell you her name, a Mrs. Clark. They'd spent their honeymoon in France, and we'd picked them up at Cherbourg. And uh, she, she was having trouble with her life belt. So I fixed that on to her, and I said, I think you'd better get into a lifeboat. There was one in the port, on the port side. So she said, no, she said, I don't want to go there. I, I don't want to leave my husband. So I said, well, it's just a cautionary measure. You get in, your husband will follow later on. And I got her away, and that was that, and then I picked up my own lifeboat and put it on. Well, things went there, and... and uh, then the third-class passengers were coming up. There were 700 of them. And they swarmed the decks, filled up the decks. And I thought, well, I'd done all I possibly could. I'd help them all I could. And I thought, well, now I'll uh, go up and get out of all this scrumming and go on the poop deck. And she was sinking past then. And all of a sudden, she lifted up quickly. And you could hear everything crashing through her. Everything that was movable was going through her. And then she went down and seemed to come up again. So I thought, well, now I'm going to leave. And um, I was hanging on to a board. We had two boards, starboard and port, which said, keep clear for belly blades. And I was hanging on to one of these. And I was getting higher and higher in the air. And I thought, well. Now I'll go, and I dropped in. I had a light built on. And I hit the water with a terrific crack. Luckily, I didn't hit anything when I dropped in. There were bodies all over the place. And then I looked up at the Titanic. The propellers were right out of water. The rudder was right out. I could see the bottom. And then gradually, she glided away. And that was that. That was the last of the Titanic. I didn't want to die, I mean, I didn't see much chance of living, but I was gradually getting frozen up. And uh, by the grace of God, I came across a lifeboat, and they pulled me in. <laughs>